<clears throat> up on our website, villagesofsantafe.org tomorrow on our blog. So you just go to the homepage, villagesofsantafe.org and scroll down, you'll see the blog, you'll see a picture and you can click on that and the uh, YouTube video will be there. I got it recording, we got it. All right, Ambrose, you wanna introduce yourself? Certainly. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ambrose Ferber, and I am uh, the Associate Director of Technology at Santa Fe Prep. I am also the Chair of the Computer Science Department, and uh, I am the Faculty Liaison for our Community Service Program here at Prep for the, uh, the Boomer Tech or Cyber Seniors, it used to be called Cyber Seniors, now it's Boomer Tech. Uh, community service program uh, in association with villages and with Anne, uh, where we had people actually coming in and having students help them with their technology. And we've done this now for a number of years. And unfortunately, COVID, of course, stopped us from being able to, to offer that this mm -hmm. last year. Um, but we are hoping that we'll be back with community service next year um, and we can continue with that. Part of that program, in addition to students helping seniors with uh, with their devices. Uh, we also often gave lectures and you know sort of little uh, uh, little seminar sessions and so forth. And so now with COVID and being unable to offer the full program and asked if we could continue the lecture series. And so here we are. This is a six part series. This particular one, this is the fifth one. And uh, the last one will be in two weeks this later this month. And, uh, but as Anne has announced early on, but I see there's a few people who've come in here. Uh, there's gonna be a three-part series over the summer, one per month, June, July, and August. June will be maps and using maps on your phone and getting the most out of that. July will be photos and sharing photos and how to manage your photos on your device. And then August is gonna be using your phone for other kinds of communication other than just phone calls and texting and how to manage large group things or one-to-one -one communication and video conference and all that kind of cool stuff that you can do with your phone now. So um, that's the introduction, that's me. The way this is gonna go, this is gonna be mostly a lecture. I may uh, occasionally throw it out a little bit, get some, uh, get some feedback from you guys. If you wanna ask a question, you can uh, just put it in chat at any time and uh, we'll be monitoring that chat and I'll start, I'll try and get to them as I can. Maybe I'll pause every now and then and sort of get to those questions. And at the end, of course, we'll have some time for questions and conversation as well. Um, good, all right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen now. All right, let me just reopen chat here, make sure I can follow that. Um, oh, and I should mention also, uh, just seeing from Ruth there, uh, thank you, Ruth, for the kind words, um, that uh, there's also another topic coming up, uh, which is uh, assistive technology. Um, we're not sure exactly that hasn't been scheduled yet, but probably sometime this fall. So using voice command stuff, using keyboard shortcuts, using uh, how, to, how to adjust your device so that fonts are larger, icons are larger, getting it to talk back to you, all of that kind of cool stuff for uh, being able to use a device if you find it difficult to use physically or visually or anything like that. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and get started with today's topic, which is spring cleaning, which seems appropriate given the weather outside. Um, what you see here, kind of in the background, is a very disgusting computer, um, but you'd be surprised how many of them get to look like that on the inside, and, uh, and we want to we wanna sort of prevent this kind of thing from happening. Um, sorry, I need to get over here, and there we go. Um, there's a lot of parts on the outside. Obviously the inside of the computer is not something that most people can easily clean themselves. You'll probably need to get some help for that. Um, but there's a lot of stuff on the outside from the screen to the keyboard to the just the case and the sides of the case um, that can be pretty gross. And, um, 
and we should talk about cleaning them. For one thing, it's not really just a matter of it being gross. Here we see this picture of a, uh, this is actually an internal picture, but the other side of this is external. This is a vent that, uh, that is part of the cooling system of a laptop computer. And this vent has become completely clogged with dust. And dust is, uh, can, when it clogs up those fans, when it clogs up those vents, it prevents the computer from cooling. And if a computer can't cool, then it does a lot of bad things. Everywhere, everything from just making your computer run a little bit more sluggishly um, to making your computer run more loudly. If you're hearing your computer fans running all the time, like if your computer is really noisy because the fans are running all the time, that's probably a good sign that it's dirty inside and that it's overheating and you're having some, and, and it's having to try and turn those fans on all the time. It also can destroy the longevity of the components on the inside of the computer. Again, heat is the enemy of pretty much everything inside of your computer. They like to run nice and cool. And, um, uh, and you can actually destroy them, even to the point where your computer might even just issue a warning and say, I'm overheating, and then it just shuts down. It may not even say that it's overheating. It might just shut down completely without warning. Um, so uh, it's really important that we clean the dust out of there to keep these computers running for a long time, to keep them feeling good. Um, and even like your dirty monitor, apart from just being sort of gross, it's a little bit like having dirty glasses. I can see a few people here wearing glasses right now. I'm wearing glasses. And you know that feeling when you take them off and you look through and you see all that crud and then you clean them off and then you put them back on and it's like, oh my goodness, I can see again. It's such a satisfying, incredible feeling. And when you don't have clean glasses, it can actually cause eye strain. And the same is true of your monitor. If your monitor is really dirty and funky, um, it can be substantially more difficult to see the screen. And apart from that, of course, cleaning the monitor, um, it can help all, cleaning everything, cleaning all of this stuff, the monitor, the vents, all of these things can help you protect the investment and make you feel really good about your computer, make you feel like it's you know not old and creaky and worn out. And in fact, some parts of the cleaning that we're gonna do today may actually genuinely improve the performance of the computer, not just, or I should say the device, not just making you feel better about it, but that's important. I think it's really important. I think a lot of people um, feel like they have to replace their devices sooner than they actually do have to replace their devices because they just feel gross and old and, rickety and keeping these things, keeping the maintenance up, cleaning and cleaning them and taking care of them and maintaining them um, can actually really, uh, you know, give them new life and make you feel like you can just keep them for a long time. See a question here from Josie. Uh, oh, uh, offer a class on selecting a new computer. Um, sure. I, we kind of did that. There is, there is one where we touched on a lot of that. Actually, I think it was the very first in this lecture series. Um, if you contact and or if you don't already have access to the blog, the recording, excuse me, the recording of that is uh, actually online and you can see that very first lecture where we talked a lot about that. Um, but we might do one that's sort of maybe a little bit more specifically that. Here's the tools you're going to need to clean the outside of the computer. By the way, this lecture today, we're going to cover both the outside and the inside. We're going to talk about cleaning both of those things. Um, you know, the physical hardware cleaning part, again, that can really help the computer run better because we get rid of the dust and all the schmutz that's you know, doing, and also just make it the computer uh, feel and look better um, by cleaning all the gunk off of it. Here's the tools you're going to need. Nothing here is really particularly specialized. Some isopropyl alcohol. Um, uh, I use 90%. It's great. We've got this. Uh, I actually have some that's even uh, more than that. This is the 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol, um, which is great. Um, 
70% though is totally fine. Uh, you're not going to hurt anything using the just like, you know, rubbing alcohol that you get from the drugstore. Uh, the reason alcohol is good is because it evaporates so quickly. So you're not going to end up with any moisture between contacts and causing a short that, uh, that might d destroy even your components. Um, the alcohol is very safe to use. And it's, you know, it's not going to harm any of the components of your computer, like the, the finish on the case or the, the screen or anything like that. Cotton swabs, depending on how dirty your computer is, you might go through a lot of cotton swabs. I have cleaned keyboards where I used up, you know, maybe 50 cotton swabs to try and clean a keyboard. Uh, maybe even a few more than that. It's just that you go through them quickly. So, you know, having a dedicated box, if you're going to, you know, if you're really like, you know, you're ready to jump in and clean your computer and like really get going with it, then, um, you know, I do suggest going and getting yourself like a nice little kit like this and getting a full box of cotton swabs dedicated to this job. The lint, a lint-free cloth. Uh, I see Marie's got looks like a uh, lint free cloth there. You Dustin Marie looks like excellent. Um, so uh, a bigger one is better. Like a uh, this one is actually a little bit smaller. I have one at home that's even bigger than this. Um, this is kind of small, but even though like the little like eyeglass ones that come with eyeglass clean, those are fine. Like you can totally use that. Um, but a bigger if you, and you can find ones that are quite large and those are very nice for cleaning the screen. Tweezers are great. I have this little kit right here. Uh, it just has four different types, uh, uh, chisel, straight, pointed. Um, it is useful to have a couple of different types, a couple of different tips on them. If you're only gonna get one though, I would suggest getting the really pointy kind, the super, super pointy kind, because those you can really dig down into some places and get them. Yeah, a microfi microfiber cloth is fine. That is absolutely fine. You just don't want, and in fact, even like Kleenex is fine. I mean, like it's not, it's not as good, but the thing is, is that the computer screen and case these days are actually a lot tougher than you think they are, probably. Like we don't have to baby them so much. They can take a fair bit of, you know, assault. And, uh, you know, it's like, I wouldn't maybe use like paper, well, I have used paper towels on a computer screen before and it was just fine. I don't recommend that just in case, you know, uh, yeah, I would hate to have somebody like scratch their screen and then come back and yell at me. Um, but any kind of soft cloth would work fine. The lint-free cloths are great because they don't leave anything behind and you know they're gonna be safe. Um, but yeah, the tweezers, having those really pointy tweezers is great. Um, having some other kinds of tweezers to like really kind of get down into those places is, uh, is even better if you, if you can get them. By the way, I do recommend, oh, sure. Anne's showing a uh, keyboard cover. Uh, you can buy these, uh, these actual covers that just fit over your keyboard and keep a lot of gunk just out of it. And then you take it off and just wash it. I mean, you can probably like hose it off or whatever, throw it in the dishwasher. I think if you're really, if, if you're prone to drinking and eating around your computer, these are great because you just pick it up and go. And there yep. it goes. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, rinse it off like the whole thing. No, those are great. I personally, I forgot to mention those because I don't like them. I don't like the way they feel when typing, but that's a personal prejudice. So, you know, I, they, they actually are great. They work, they work very well. Um, I would... Probably buy, I mean, tweezers are not that expensive. I mean, you can spend a lot of money on tweezers, but don't get expensive tweezers, but get some dedicated tweezers. Some tweezers that you use only for cleaning your computer, just because you're going to probably be grabbing some grody things and I don't know, maybe you don't care, or maybe you just, you can clean them off, of course. I have a dedicated set of tweezers for computer stuff. Um, so that I'm not, you know, nobody's tweezing their eyebrows with computer tweezers. Some compressed air, great thing. That's just these, uh, these cans. Oops, this one broke. Just like puffs out the air, the compressed air. Those are super useful. 
Um, if you have a small, like uh, a very small air compressor, uh, especially like if anybody does airbrush work, those compressors without any um, paint in it, obviously, um, but you know, a completely clean hose, clear hose with no paint, and but that size compressor also works extremely well if you have something like that. You can also use like a regular compressor, like a big compressor, just turn the pressure down. You don't need a whole lot, um, just you know, a few pounds of pressure, maybe 10, 12, maybe up to 15 pounds of pressure is fine. And, um, and you can spray stuff off. The idea is just to get something that you can forcefully spray dust off with. Um, but of course, a compressor is, you know, it's a bigger, noisier kind of thing. And those cans of compressed air are nice because you can just keep it in a, you know, desk drawer or something near your computer and easily spray stuff off. Um, some old t-shirts, old rags, just, you know, like a soft cotton fiber uh, rag is fine for the outside, for the case of the computer. I don't use those on the screen as a rule. But, um, but for the rest of the case, they're totally fine, especially if you have stuff that's, you know, if you have a much older computer or computer maybe that's been sitting in storage somewhere and it's kind of gross and you want to bring life back to it, then uh, having some t-shirts is essential because there's going to be some really sort of like actual filth that you'll need to clean off of things. And you don't want to like get your fancy microfiber lint-free cloth thing all dirty as a result of that. So having some old t-shirts is a really good idea. You may have seen these uh, dedicated screen wipes, these uh, screen cleaning wipes um, at the store. I, I, I don't have any objection to them. I, there's nothing wrong with them. They're not going to break anything or harm anything. But they're not super necessary. I have never found them to be completely necessary. I do just fine with isopropyl alcohol and a cleaning cloth. Now these wipes do have a, um, they have some other stuff in them that kind of sort of polishes the screen a little bit. And some people say that they feel like their screen is better looking after using those wipes than just isopropyl alcohol. Maybe, you know, pick up a couple and try them out and see if you really like them a lot better. Um, I, I don't use them. I just use isopropyl alcohol and a cloth. It doesn't seem, to me, um, regular cleaning seems to do the, the, the right thing. Um, yes, old flannel is very soft. Yeah. I've never used it, though. I assume it would probably be fine. All right. Before we actually clean anything, or talk about cleaning anything. Little safety message, please turn off your computer, but not right now <laughs> because you need it for this. So, I mean, if you wanna work on another device, if you have another device lying around that you wanna use and follow along as I go through these steps, otherwise just take notes, look at this thing later, review the recording of this lecture and, uh, and then clean the computer. We do want to turn everything off. Some, in some parts, some ways, it's a safety thing, right? Like we don't want to get any fluids on while it's turned on. But also, it's just a convenience thing. If you're cleaning your keyboard and it's a built-in keyboard, like on a laptop, um, you're going to be pressing down on those keys. And if your computer's on, it's going to be registering those key presses. So it's better to just have the computer off so that you can like push down on those keys and clean them with your little cotton swab and whatnot. Elias asking, can you use alcohol on the screen? Yes, absolutely. Well, isopropyl alcohol. I wouldn't pour your good brandy over the screen of your computer, but you can absolutely use a little isopropyl alcohol. Um, we're going to talk about that and clean the screen with isopropyl. Like I said, these screens are way tough. A lot of people, there's this sort of like mythology that these screens that you just take like a, a dry, lint-free cloth and give it a very gentle wipe. Um, that's not going to cut it. Also, I mean, if nothing else, like a lot of your screens, your phone screen, your tablet screen, many computer screens are touch screens now. So you're gonna have fingerprints and garbage all over it. Um, if you're like me, you've got a device in the kitchen that you use to look at your recipes while you're cooking. And that thing's probably covered in all sorts of food filth. And um, a, a gentle wipe with a lint-free cloth is not gonna cut it. You're gonna wanna 
douse that thing in isopropyl alcohol and uh, give it a good scrub, honestly. Um, but let's start with dust. What you want to do is a combination here of my camera as well as uh, as well as the, the shared screen. So the bottom of this laptop, you can see maybe it has these two fans here and a whole bunch of vents going all up and down here. Most Macs, most Apple modern Macs have vents that are along the back edge somewhere there. You want to find any place that you can that where there's a vent or a fan. You want to find any of those places that you can and you want to spray the heck out of it with compressed air. And if you need to, if there's like big chunks, take some tweezers and kind of pull stuff out, pull stuff away. Incidentally, now is a good time to mention something else that seems to, this has nothing to do with how clean your computer is, but it is a related topic, which is that I see a lot of people whose computers are not running at peak efficiency or even are shutting down on their own or even damaging computers components on the inside because the computer is getting too hot because they're using their laptop laptop on a blanket or a pillow and um, they have it on their lap and then blanket they're sitting in bed and they've got the laptop sitting on the blanket big poofy down comforter or whatever in the middle of winter and what you're doing when you use your, your laptop that way is you are occluding all of those vents and you are making that computer work very very hard to try and cool itself down Short periods of time, just need to look something up really quickly. Um, that's, you know, that it's not a problem. But if you're going to like watch an entire movie on a laptop in bed, then you might want to figure out a way to have those vents be lifted up off the surface or opened up or somehow in some other way um, exposed so that the computer can cool itself off. You see that a lot, actually, especially we saw it in school here um, with all the kids on Zoom and you know, fully remote and they were all like coming to class from their bedrooms and sitting on their beds with their computers there and they were running into issues of overheating because they were doing it all day long. Um, something else to, uh, to take a look at, especially if, you, if your phone is having trouble charging and it seems like maybe there's something wrong with the cable that you plug in the cable to charge it and um, maybe you wiggle the cable and it charges like it does not charging, but then if you wiggle the cable, it does charge. There is a good chance that there is nothing wrong with that cable or with that charging port, but that in fact, there is lint packed into the charging port hole. And I will tell you now from multiple experiences that it is perhaps the most satisfying thing you will ever do in your entire life is to take a, a, a toothpick or some very fine tweezers, gently reach into there and pull out a big chunk of compacted lint. There is nothing on the planet that is better. You thought maybe being married was good. You thought that you enjoyed food. No, none of that compares to pulling a chunk of compressed lint out of the charging port of your phone and then plugging in the cable and it works perfectly. And you're like, oh my God, I just fixed this. I am a tech genius. You can also check the headphone port if you have one. If those of you with modern um, uh, iPhones don't have that, but anybody else, uh, you might uh, check the headphone port as well for compressed lint deep in that socket. Be very careful. When you do this, um, there are there is there there are metal components on the inside there, um, and you can damage them. Although I've never seen I've never actually seen anybody damage it doing this. Just be very careful to kind of pick things out. You can use a toothpick if you want to pick things out because it's wood and it's less likely to damage anything that's on the inside of that port. Something else uh, worth mentioning. I don't have any pictures of it here. Um, if anybody has an old mouse, the kind that still has a little ball on the inside of the mouse, like if you flip the mouse over, if you're using A, you'd have to be using a desktop. B, um, you'd have to have an external mouse on that desktop. And C, you'd have to be from 1994 when people stopped using those old mice. But if all of those things are true and you have one of those old mice, 
and it feels like it's not working very well. Like you move it and it kind of, especially if it makes some noise, kind of like a, a rattling or clicking noise, um, or, and it doesn't, and it just seems like as you move the mouse around, it's not doing well. You can actually flip that mouse over. There's a little ring that you twist and pop it out and the little mouse ball will pop out. You'll see a couple of rollers on the inside. Those rollers may very well be covered in schmutz is the technical term and um, all sorts of other things rolled up in those rollers. The mouse ball itself may be covered in grime. Isopropyl alcohol, tweezers, and some time and patience. And you can clean that mouse out completely and it will feel as good as new. Again, this is among the more satisfying things you can do with your life is cleaning an old mouse, especially one that's very, very dirty. The screen, let's go ahead and take a look. I'm gonna try and do this on camera. It's not, I was practicing earlier and it's a little difficult. So I have a laptop here. You can see the screen is quite dirty on this laptop. It sees a lot of use. What I want you to do, and this is something you can do with the computer on, by the way, it doesn't matter. So if you have some isopropyl alcohol and you have a cloth, a suitable cloth, you can join in. Otherwise, you can just watch me do it. Um, I, uh, in fact, let's do this. I'm gonna pause the share. And I am going to spotlight myself. And um, uh, I'm going to really just drench this cloth in isopropyl. Do not be shy. You don't have to be like really gentle and like just barely mist it with isopropyl. It, it, it uh, evaporates so quickly. It doesn't matter. And likewise, as I clean this screen, I'm just going to like, I'm not going to, I'm just going to get it covered in isopropyl as much as I can. And I'm going to go ahead and dig in there pretty substantially. I'm even going to kind of scrub it off. And then it's going to take a few passes then with the dry side of the cloth, you know, just folding the cloth, giving it the dry side of it and getting in there and swiping it. You also, as you do this, you want to try and look at the screen from multiple angles. If it's a desktop screen, you'll have to move yourself and sort of look at it from different angles, get different kinds of reflection on it so that you can spot all the little grody goobers on there and get them off. Like I said, you do not need to be super gentle. I mean, you don't want to uh, put a lot of force on this. You don't want to lay it down on the ground and scrub it, um, but you can give it some good elbow grease. They're, they're pretty strong. Um, the danger is, is that you could Theoretically, crack your screen if you press too hard, especially if you're pushing from two sides, if you're pushing from the top of the screen and then down low on the screen and creating a, a force, an opposing force like this, that'd be more likely to crack the screen than if you can hold the screen directly where you are scrubbing it. Um, I use circular motions to clean it off and then um, and again, it might take several passes with your cleaning cloth to get all of the swirlies off and all of the googers off and, um, and all of that. This is true, this, that technique is true. The, uh, all right, should be back on the shared screen now. Um, whether this is a, a phone or your computer or a monitor or extra monitor, your TV, honestly, like doesn't matter, um, tablets, like anything with a screen, this technique works great. Just douse the cloth with a lot of isopropyl alcohol, give it a good scrub, then fold the cloth to get dry sides and just kind of keep wiping away at it. Be patient. It takes a few iterations usually to get it clean. This is exciting. I'm seeing people, you know, like actually with their claws getting out there, cleaning this off. All right, next up is the keyboard. This is going to, if, if, if your keyboard is at all dirty, um, this is gonna be pretty terrible because there's no shortcut. 
You can give it one good thing to do at first. Here I have a keyboard is just turn it upside down and shake it. That'll get maybe some stuff out of it. If you have a laptop, it's probably not gonna help so much. Most laptops don't have a lot of as much space in there as um, like, you know, plug-in keyboards or whatever like this one. Um, so uh, you can use your compressed air to spray out. Tweezers will help get a lot of the like big chunky monkeys out of there. But the main thing that you'll have to do is, and what I usually do is I pour a little bit of isopropyl alcohol into the cap of the bottle. So I have like a little, uh, you know, reservoir of IPA. And then I dunk one end of the uh, cotton swab into that. And then I sit and I scrub the top and each side of each and every key. And you just scrub it off. Um, and depending on how dirty your keyboard is, you may get one key per, per end of the cotton swab. So two keys per swab, because you have two ends on the swabs. And there is, it just takes forever and it's really arduous. But when you're done, you will feel amazing. You'll be like, oh man, this keyboard looks and feels just incredible. It's so wonderful. I love it. And um, yeah, I, I've seen some keyboards that were very, very dirty and they really just do take some scrubbing. If your keyboard is not like this, then you may not even need the cotton swabs. You may just need the cloth, your lint-free cloth. Just give it kind of a good wiping um, across the top, again, with the computer off so you're not registering all those key presses. And just give it a good once over. Um, you can vacuum computers. You can you know, use the brush attachment on the vacuum and uh, just give it a, a, a quick swipe with the vacuum. That can often help out with uh, getting the keyboard clean, especially if it's not funky. But if you've had your keyboard a few years and, um, and it's got like, you know, discoloration and grime on it, then you definitely are gonna need to sit there and scrub with uh, no amount of wiping is really gonna work. You're gonna need that cotton swab. Um, everything else on the computer. So the outside of the case, the sides next to the trackpad on a laptop or, you know, back, like all of that stuff. Just IPA, old shirts, tweezers, cotton swabs, all that stuff just to get into all the little corners and crevices and wipe it and scrub and clean all of that off. Um, for things that are not the screen, um, a mild all-purpose cleaner, you can even dilute uh, an all-purpose cleaner is fine. Um, it just don't, you don't want to be like crazy, like, you know, you know, huge amounts of that stuff and always spray the cloth. Um, never spray the all-purpose cleaner directly on the computer. You always want to spray the cloth and then use the cloth to wipe the computer. And if it's a, you know, you might want to, depending on the, if you're, if it's, especially if it's a little bit more of a heavy hitter cleaner, um, just test on an obscure part of the computer, make sure it doesn't discolor the finish or remove the finish or anything like that. Um, but again, these days that's pretty rare. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as you are not going bananas with the cleaner, it should be just fine. You can really breathe some nice life into things, I have to say. If things are really dirty, or if after you've done this, it's still turning off because it's overheating, um, or if you like looking in through the vents and you can see all kinds of stuff in there that you just can't reach with your tools, um, if you smoke indoors or if anybody in the house or anybody, if that computer was ever where somebody smokes, um, that can wreak havoc on the interior of a computer. It generates a huge amount of this uh, residue on the inside of the computer because all computers are sucking the air around it in to try and cool it and blowing it across components and then blowing it out the other side. So any contaminants in the air get sucked into the computer and get deposited all over everything. Um, you know, if the computer has been in a really dusty location, something like that, anything that's really gross, then uh, it needs to be taken apart to be cleaned. I've put a link here to a website called ifixit.com. Those of you who are a little bit more tech adventurous, um, you know, who maybe have a set of micro screwdrivers in the house, 
Um, you could attempt to do this yourself. Um, iFixit has great tutorials with lots of great pictures. They even sell really great toolkits for, um, for taking computers apart. And uh, then you can really get in there and clean all of that stuff. And, and I, I promise you like taking them apart is not as hard as, um, as, uh, as you might think. Uh, okay, good question here. Spraying directly into a vent would just spread the dust among the other components. That is definitely possible. If there is enough dust, spraying compressed air from the outside of the vent can just cause that, that dust to uh, just like push it deeper into the computer. That can happen. Um, usually when I spray, I try to spray a little bit to the so from the side. So it kind of like shoots it off the, you know, like across the surface of the thing. And again, so yes, that is a really good point that um, you need to, be, and, and again, like if there is a lot of dust on these things, if it's caked in dust, then um, you're probably gonna need to take it apart. Taking computers apart isn't as hard as it sounds, I promise. And if anybody is interested in that, let me know, drop me a line, drop me a note. And um, I can help you pick the right tools and sort of like the right setup for doing it if you want to give it a shot. Otherwise, you can call me or somebody else. And for a fee, um, somebody will take your computer apart and clean it all out, get everything going. Again, I wouldn't do that unless you have suspicions of there being a particular reason why it's dirty, um, like particularly dirty. Um, if it's just sort of as regular maintenance, you probably don't need to do that. All right, on to the insides. Not the hardware insides, but the software insides. Let's talk about how to uh, keep your computer running nice and fresh and clean and um, doing all that good stuff that we want it to do. Um, and we do this pretty regularly. Uh, or, you know, if you do all of this once a, once a year, uh, not all, some of these things should be more often than that. And we'll talk about that. Um, but if you do like sort of a major cleaning once a year, that's totally acceptable. Um, the first thing is, is to keep your computer up to date. This is important for a lot of reasons. Um, it's a security issue. We want to be sure that we are staying on top of security releases for our operating systems and for our programs. Otherwise, we are more at risk of being attacked. Um, you probably have heard of, or you have been suspicious of, or even been the victim of a buggy first release of a major update, right? Like if you updated to Mac OS Big Sur, the moment it came out, you probably had a couple of issues with it, or um, you knew somebody who had a couple of issues with it. And that's true. When there is a major update to the operating system, it can take a little while for it to not be buggy anymore. And it's totally acceptable to wait a month or two to sort of see how things shake out with those major releases. Like it'll have a new name. Um, <laughs> yes, for Linux as well, absolutely. Linux updates are really important. Ben and Ben, are you guys running Linux? <laughs> That's that's pretty awesome if you guys are running Linux. Um, but yes, absolutely, you want to keep everything up to date as much as possible. Um, that's awesome, Ben. Uh, we should talk about that sometime. Um, so, uh, uh, but those major updates, right? Those like named updates, like when Mac OS goes from Catalina to Big Sur, right? That's a major update. You can wait a month or two, see how things shake out before you make before you do that update. However, um, that's different from when we get security fixes, when there's small incremental changes, like when we go from um, Mac OS 11.0.1 to Mac OS 11.1.3 or whatever, right? Those small updates, when you see them in software update, please, please, please always do them. And you want to do the big updates eventually, unless your computer is so old that it can no longer run those latest versions. Although you, you usually won't even be prompted to download it if your computer can't run it. 
It's a good idea to turn on auto updates all the time on all of your devices. But it's good to know where these things live so that you can sort of make sure when you're doing this big clean and sort of like, you know, big refresh on your computer to know where these things are. So on Mac OS, if you go to system preferences, so the Apple menu system preferences, software update, it's one of the buttons there. It looks like kind of like a gear, but it's something like clockwork thing. Um, you'll see there if there are any updates that need to be installed. That's also where the checkbox will be for um, automatically keep it up to date. In Windows, you can just hit the start menu and type Windows update, or you can go to settings and search for update and you'll get the Windows update screen where you can see what updates have been installed and what updates are still pending. iOS, also on your iPhone, this will be under settings, general and software update. And on Android, it'll be under settings, system advanced system update. And this, again, this presentation will be available online so you can come back and reference this. Also, Google, you know, just if you Google the device you have and system update or software update or anything like that, it'll be easy to find instructions for where these things are. But you want us to make sure you stay up to date as much as you can. All right, step two, startup cleanup. Something that happens a lot on, uh, this is not so much a mobile device thing. This isn't really something that happens on iPhones or Android phones or anything like that. This is really a computer thing, um, which is that you may have installed some things or some things may have, um, uh, you know, you like as you've worked with your computer over the years and done some stuff, some things will have installed these startup items, these little programs that launch when the computer first turns on. So whenever you reboot the computer, or start it up from, from when you shut down, um, just these programs, just without you even being aware of it, silently and invisibly, just start up. This can have a deleterious effect on your performance because there's all these programs running in the background. And sometimes there are even things that are uh, borderline malicious or uh, at the very least just sort of irritating. They can, there can be services in there hiding out, you know, launching uh, pop-up windows and all kinds of stuff. So it's a good idea to have a look at that. On Mac, it's under system preferences, again, and then users and accounts. And then there's a tab at the top called login items. You can see a screenshot of it here. Um, and, uh, what, and be careful because it, this doesn't just mean, some people get confused because they see the checkbox. And when the checkbox isn't checked, they think, oh, this isn't running. That just means that checkbox only means whether or not it's hidden from you when it starts up, not whether or not it's there. What you actually want to do is click on the item and then down at the bottom, do you see the little plus and the minus? Click that minus and get rid of it. Um, anything weird in there, definitely get rid of. So anything related to probably Chrome, if you use Chrome and um, yes, this presentation will also be available on the blog tomorrow. Yeah, the recorded version of it. Um, if you're unsure of something, you can ask or Google it or something or just turn or, you know, delete it. And if something then starts acting funky on your, it seems weird, then you can add it back in. Um, but it's a good idea to just sort of have not very many things running under startup. It should be a minimal list. This guy, this screenshot that I picked up from this guy named Joe Kissel, uh, this is not my computer. This is it. This is like, this hurts me seeing his login items. This like physically pains me. I get like a little pain in my gut looking at all of those startup items. On Windows, it's under settings. You can just search for startup apps. And there's a thing, it's very similar interface that lets you turn um, startup items on and off from within it. Really good idea to clean that up. Step three. Step three is going to be long. We're going to go through a bunch of, how do we know what should be in the startup menu? Well, really, 
it should only be there if it's something you use at all. So like if you use, um, if we can go back here. So like we can see that there's a, a Dropbox item in here. Having Dropbox be a part of the login items, be in the startup menu, means that Dropbox, whenever your computer starts up, you will have all of the Dropbox services available to you um, without ever like having to open it and you know start it up or anything like that, um, which can be very convenient in which case, and if you use Dropbox, if you are a Dropbox user and that's there, um, then that could be a convenient thing and you can leave it. If you don't use Dropbox, get rid of it, right? If, uh, if Skype is a notorious, leaker it like always goes in there so that it can always be running in the background so if you get calls it can ring like forget it i do when if, if i'm going to use skype it's probably going to be scheduled i don't want to log in items get rid of it okay um if it looks weird you can probably get rid of it All right, so step three, we're going to go through a number of screens because uh, we're going to go through step three for different platforms. So if you're on Windows, hang tight. We're going to do Mac first, um, and then we'll get to Windows. Then we're going to get to the mobile devices. So this is going to continue, you know, you might, uh, might check out for a little bit of this. Like if you don't use a Mac, the next couple of screens are not going to be that useful for you. So um, on a Mac, you want to look at your desktop and look for any shortcuts um, on, that are sitting out on the desktop and, uh, and any shortcuts for documents. If you're not using it anymore, just delete it. You can just take it, drag it to the trash, um, and forget it. Then, once you've done that, open up the Applications folder, which is found in the Finder. If you open up a Finder window, just a regular organizational window, and over on the left-hand side, there should be one called Applications. And if you click on that, you'll see all of your applications. Make a note of the ones that you don't think you need or use anymore. Okay, just you know, take a look and be like, I don't need this. Now, many of these apps are ones that come from Apple. It doesn't hurt anything to get rid of them. Um, but they don't take up much space. What you're mainly looking for are things that you install that you're no longer using anymore. And make a note of those. To get rid of them is a little bit complicated, potentially. First thing you can do is you can go, you can open up Launchpad. It's the little spaceship down in your dock, usually at the left side of the dock. And if you open up Launchpad, you can click and hold. If you long press on one of the icons in there, it may start to jiggle and give you a little X. And then you can click the X and it will uninstall, delete that program. If it doesn't have an X, that means you can't get rid of it from Launchpad. Launchpad doesn't let you do that. If you installed the program from the App Store, you can open up the App Store, which we have here, and uh, you can search for the app, find it, and then there will be a button that says uninstall, and you can uninstall it from here. But that only works if it's something that you installed from the App Store. The last thing I want to so let me go back. If neither of those things work, you can use something called App Zapper which is a great little utility. It does cost a little bit. I don't remember how much it costs. It's not terribly expensive. It's something on the order of $20 or something like that. An app zapper lets you delete programs completely and fully as if they were fully uninstalled. Any program, um, you just drag it onto app zapper and it makes this uh, crazy sound and then the app is gone. If you don't want to spend the money for App Zapper, you're only, and, and neither of these other techniques will work, you're only left with taking the program from here and putting it in the trash, which will delete the program. It will leave behind some remnants of itself in some various folders. There are preferences and um, some other temporary application files and things like that in other parts of the computer where that will get left behind. Usually those files are not very big, so they don't take up a lot of space, but it's less uh, complete than an actual 
uninstall. And that's why App Zapper is so beautiful, is that it does that. It gets all of those files from everywhere and deletes them. I'm a big fan of App Zapper. I love them. Um, I've been using it for years and years and years on Macs. This is all because Mac OS does not include an uninstaller. For some reason, Apple has never done that. I don't know why. <clears throat> because on Windows, to get rid of a program, open settings, search for add or remove programs, click on the program you want to get rid of and click on install and it will be uninstalled. This is one area in which Windows definitely kicks Mac's butt. Not a lot of areas, but this is definitely one of them. On iOS, if you identify an application that you don't like, um, this is so like if you're just looking at your screen and you see programs and you know, like, oh, look at this app. I don't use it anymore. I should get rid of that because I definitely am not interested in it anymore. Long press it. So again, just like hold your finger down on it until depending on what version you have, it will either show the thing on the left, this like little drop down menu, or it will give you a little minus sign. It'll, the Apple, the icon will start jiggling and it will give you a little minus sign in the corner. Um, and then you can click remove app or the little minus sign you will get a confirmation of whether or not you want to delete it. And then you can delete the app that way. If you need a little bit of help knowing what apps to get rid of, you can open up your settings on your iPhone and go to general and then iPhone storage. And then if you scroll down, um, you'll see the apps down below. That's kind of more of the thing on the right-hand side here, these two screenshots. And if you click on one of those apps, you'll you presented with a few things you can do, but two of them are offload or delete. Offloading an app um, just means that it keeps actually all of the settings on your phone, excuse me, all of the settings and files for that app stay on your phone. Um, and the icon even stays, but it gets like a little cloud icon on it, but the icon stays on the phone. Um, but the app itself gets deleted and you'll usually save. like here, if I were to offload Infinity Blade 2, if you look at that list there, you can see it would remove 1.35 gigabytes by offloading, it, which is quite significant, actually. Then, um, but deleting, if, if I want to, if I choose delete, when I click on one of these apps here, if I choose delete, that actually gets rid of all the files and the icon and everything associated with that app. It's completely gone and will actually save more space still. There is a little button. If you look on that left-hand side screenshot, there's uh, kind of uh, near the top, there's something that says offload unused apps. And uh, if you enable that, the phone will determine when you, and I don't know what magic sauce uh, Apple uses to determine how long it is since you last used the app that it determines that it's unused. I don't know, but it will automatically offload. So it will keep all the files for it and everything, but then it'll get rid of apps that you haven't used in a long time. which is quite convenient. On Android, um, similarly, um, if you, uh, you can long press on Android also and then go to remove, but you can also go to enter settings, apps and notifications, and then click on see all apps. If you tap an app, it'll give you an uninstall option. Then here is something that Android does that is just beautiful. Um, if you go to settings and then storage and tap on the internal storage uh, choice next, and then there's a button that says uh, free up space, you will be presented with a ton of options for getting rid of all kinds of things off of your Android phone that you don't need anymore. That will save you a ton of space, make everything feel really clean and fresh and good. All right, step four, 
on Mac OS, um, tidying up the storage disk is a really good idea. This is something else to do once a year, a couple times a year, something like that when you're doing your cleaning, which is to go to applications, utilities, and then disk utility. And if you choose your computer here, most likely it'll be called Macintosh HD, unless you've changed the name of it. And you can see a screenshot of more or less of what that looks like. If you click on first aid and then, uh, uh, and from first aid, you can verify and repair the disc. This does some really nice stuff as part of your screen cleaning. It just uh, gets rid of some temporary files, um, repairs some files that might be corrupted, um, reorders some things. It's all under the hood stuff, right? You really don't need, and it's just good. And your computer may even feel a little bit fresher as a result of doing this a little bit faster, even after having done this. On Windows, um, we can get rid of temp files very easily. If you click the start menu and type disk cleanup, we can select a whole bunch of different kinds of files here. Everything from setup log files to downloaded program files, temporary files, all sorts of like stuff that just kind of builds up a lot of space and, uh, and then click OK. Now, at this point, I'm set here on the slide to not select the recycle bin, to empty the recycle bin. That's, you can if you want to. Like, if, you know, if you're like, you know that like it's ready to be emptied, sure. Some people like to make sure that the recycle bin uh, still has old files in it. Um, you know, so that's a little bit of a personal choice. But if you're OK with everything that you've deleted and put into the recycling bin, permanently going away, then you can also select the recycle bin from here and have that be emptied as part of this process. All right, this is the part that everyone dreads, and yet it can be the most gratifying and rewarding part of this whole process um, for uh, the insides of your computer, which is to go through your downloads, your documents and your desktop folders. Like go through all of those places, look at your desktop, look inside your documents folders, look in everywhere and do three things. Toss stuff, just get rid of it. Be brave, be strong, get rid of it. Things that you're not using um, that are, uh, but, but that you wanna keep, you can archive them. It's nice to, uh, you know, you can either, um, you know, get a, an external hard drive or use some cloud storage. You can see the previous lecture on cloud storage um, or just create a folder called archive where you put all of that stuff that's like, I need to keep this, but it's not active work. Um, it can be its own thing. Um, you can even burn it to CDs or DVDs or something if you're really old school, um, but in any case, sort of making sure that those folders all only have what's in them that you need to have in them. And then reorganize, go through all those files, go through all that stuff, put things in proper folders, um, nest folders inside of each other and really organize your files into something that makes sense for how to work on things. Perhaps one day that might be another lecture topic and is like how to organize files, like because that's its own topic. I have time right now to go through that, but reorganizing files, it's an art um, and it's a good thing to do. A hint here, your downloads folder, when you're done with this process, your spring cleaning, your downloads folder should be empty. There should be nothing in your downloads folder. Um, <laughs> cool, all right. Everything uh, should be organized into documents. If you use your desktop, sure, but it should be clean and neat and organized and everything in its proper place. Now, at this point, um, you should be able to empty the trash or the recycling bin, depending on if you're Mac or Windows, and get rid of all the things that you purged. Um, okay, cool. Some calls for how to organize. Um, that seems like a great topic. I'd love to do that. Um, it's uh, I'm a big stickler for keeping computers strictly organized. So we can talk about that. That would be a great topic. Um, that's it. That is your spring cleaning. Um, that is uh, the outside of the computer, cleaning it, um, as well as getting the insides 
tidied up a little bit. And just because the inside computer thing that was, there was a lot packed in there. We don't have time to like delve deeply into each one of those. And I apologize for that. The, the overarching purpose of that internal clean is to get rid of stuff you don't use anymore. It's just like your house, right? It's that, you know, bringing joy or whatever. Like, like if it's not doing something for you, get rid of it. You don't need it there. The nice thing about a computer is that as long as you're not short on space, it doesn't really matter. You can keep old stuff, like old files aren't gonna slow your computer down unless the hard drive is really, really full, in which case you're gonna wanna offload as many of those files to somewhere else as you can. But getting rid of programs that you don't use, getting rid of files you don't need or use, um, and making sure that everything is up to date and spruced up, it's gonna really make you feel a lot better about using your device. Um, that's it. Uh, we are now here for Q&A. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments or things, other things they'd like to ask, um, here we are. You can actually unmute at this point if you would like and ask a question or you can put your question in chat. What does it mean when my monitor shows a battery at the upper right hand side of the monitor? Um, so I assume that is on a laptop, right, Carmen? No, it's on a hard, it's on a desktop. On and, a desktop. Uh, and the battery just keeps blinking. Um, While I'm shutting it off, I'm wondering, is my monitor going bad or? No, uh, that wouldn't that that wouldn't really be a sign of a monitor going bad. Um, when you reboot your computer, do you get any weird? When was the last time you restarted your computer? I restart it every day. Every day, and when it restarts, you don't get a message that's like the clock is off, or um, you know, like it doesn't show the date as being January first, uh, nineteen sixty nine, or anything like that. Right. Nothing. Nothing shows different. Uh, just that when I shut it down at night. It's blinking on the right hand side, like like the battery's low or something. Yeah, so a desktop computer doesn't, I mean, it has a tiny little battery, like a watch battery in it that keeps the clock running, the internal clock running, and that battery can fail and get old. Um, it's possible that, that, that uh, are you on, I assume you're on Windows then. I'm on the Windows and I'm on a desktop with the right window. And the, it shows it on the monitor, not on, the computer but maybe it's telling me about the oh computer. wait so it's like so like the monitor like somewhere not on the screen but like on the edge of the monitor like not really a part of the right when i'm shutting down it, and, and the screen's going dark it's on the right hand side blinking i'm not sure do you have a ups like a battery backup no i do not hmm. um that is weird uh you don't normally see that so uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, we, we probably have to, um, uh, you might need to get somebody in or, or if you can take a video of that happening, um, then maybe we can uh, analyze that somehow just so I can kind of see it. Um, if you wanna take a video and send it to me via Anne, um, that would be, I'd be happy to respond to that. So, Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, all right, so uh, Jerry and Jenny, recently opening Excel and Word files has been quite slow. What could be causing this? So it could be a couple of things. Um, uh, uh, first of all, are you using a uh, are you using Windows or a Mac, Jerry and Jenny? Windows. Windows. Um, so uh, you can open up Activity Monitor. If you hit Control Alt Delete, um, you'll get a blue screen with some options. You can click on Activity Monitor, and you can look to see what things are running. And you can even sort by CPU and by memory and see if there's like something that's just sucking up a ton of of, uh, of juice there. Um, another thing could be that if your hard drive is getting full then um, you know, computers do use a hard drive space, empty hard drive space as sort of like a scratch pad. And if, that, if the hard drive is very, very full, those programs can have a hard time um, sometimes running and doing stuff. Probably the culprit though is more likely other programs running. And um, 
uh, and uh, especially like, do you have a, a web browser open with a lot of tabs open by any chance? Not usually, but the, I, will, I will look for that and make sure. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Sometimes people will run Google Chrome and they'll have, um, you know, tons and tons of tabs open and that can just bring a computer to a dead crawl a lot of the time and other programs, you know, so just check for other programs running either an activity monitor or just down in the, the taskbar at the bottom of the screen and look for other stuff that's running, especially things like Zoom are running. This can use up a lot or Photoshop or whatever. I mean, those things use up a lot of resources. And so then Word and Excel will have a harder time running. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's probably a resource. If, if this is a new thing, right? Like if it's, um, if it, was working fine before and then all of a sudden it's like why is this so slow it's probably because something's eating up a lot of resource it's also possible although unlikely if you recently updated word and Excel, if you recently updated office that the newer version is doing bad things with your computer and i know i just said please update everything and usually that's the case but sometimes we can have problems with that um, all right, please remind us how often should an iPhone be completely turned off? Um, I, it, there's, it doesn't need to be turned off unless it needs to be turned off. Um, there's no real, uh, no real compelling reason why you have to turn an iPhone off. If it's misbehaving, if there's something like weird with it, or if it's like acting funny, then restarting it can often fix those problems. Um, and it will restart on its own if it's doing a system update. Um, but uh, but just but you, there's no prescribed need to turn an iPhone off completely and sort of like let it sit there for a while. It's only a troubleshooting step if something's going wrong. Yeah. Um, cool. I think did I get any other? Did I miss any questions? I don't think so. Um, Oh, VPN, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, was that Elio maybe? Um, who, uh, so uh, the issue of VPNs was brought up. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And VPNs were originally invented. The, the original idea behind having a VPN was so that you could securely access a computer um, from a different network so the use case really was like you had a work computer. You had this like computer at work and that computer was on, was securely on the work network, right? And so like it was hardened against external attack and you were working on secret files at your work. And then when you went home and you wanted to be able to access those files, you could use a VPN that would be this way of accessing the work network in order for you to access your own computer and work with those secure files in a very, very secure fashion. And um, if you can sort of think of it as this like secret tunnel to your workplace computer. Um, but VPNs now are marketed often as a way to um, be able to access the internet in a more private way so that um, you are, um, you can, it, your, your actual location, your real location, um, a lot of details about your computer, um, a lot of that stuff is obfuscated from public view. Because the idea is with a VPN is, is that your computer is securely connecting to another computer and that computer is the one that is accessing the internet for you. And so that any Google stuff, any kind of privacy violation stuff that's happening is happening to that remote computer, um, not to you. So it helps to obfuscate who you are. It can also help you to, um, it's, it's a one way to get around a firewall so the students here love to pretend like they're pulling one over on us when they install a VPN and then they use that VPN to access the internet so that they can access websites that are blocked by our firewall. But of course we can see when they're doing that. We can't see what they're actually doing, but we can totally see when they are accessing the internet over a VPN. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, so VPNs are good, they are handy. Um, usually the good ones cost money, generally speaking. Um, you wouldn't really want to use a service like that if there was, if it was free, because how are they monetizing? They have to monetize it somehow. Um, if you are a privacy and security fiend, if you're really into that, um, they're a great idea. 
and, um, and, and not a terrible thing. Sometimes people can experience a slight slowdown. So sometimes they don't use a VPN for everything. They only use a VPN if they're doing sort of more private kind of work, like financial stuff or really personal kinds of things online. Um, thank you, Jerry and Jenny. Uh, let's see, what is uh, this from Carmen? Oh, okay, uh, uh, Carmen, uh, let's, let's talk offline at some point. Actually, Carmen, can you send me an email or send an email to Anne and she can send it to me. Uh, she can connect us to answer that question. It's kind of a longer thing than we have time for. All right, Anne, hearing aids interfering with the iPhone. Ooh. Um, Oh, I, so does it, do they interfere all the time or do they just, um, just when you're trying to talk on it, like it's a, like with a phone up to your ear? Oh, you have to take out your hearing aids, turn them up to reconnect with iPhone apps, etc. Um, that is very interesting. Um, okay, so almost all of the time. I, I, unfortunately, I have to plead that I don't know the answer to this. I am not, um, I haven't encountered this. My, my first initial thoughts are um, maybe Bluetooth. Um, like if you can turn off, if you're not using any Bluetooth devices, um, that you can turn Bluetooth off on the phone. And maybe that's one of the things that's causing interference. I've not heard of actual like mobile data interference or Wi-Fi interference with iPhones or with the hearing aids, excuse me. So I'm trying to think of like things that are more specific to the phone than they are to just sort of general network and general stuff. So um, I, yeah, maybe Bluetooth would be the culprit there. Um, but I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting thing. I should, I, I could maybe do some research on that and try and figure out what that is, that is a bummer. Um, oh, you turned Bluetooth off and it worked? Uh, okay, <laughs> all right, that's uh, <laughs> good. Well, <clears throat> uh, I should set out a tip jar or something, you know, like uh, <laughs> some kind of way of people donating money to me. Um, so, uh, Ah, okay, cool. There's, thank you for that. Um, okay, yes, but I don't know when it is working on the phone. Okay. Um, yeah, and maybe, maybe we should take this offline at some point too and kind of talk about it because, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting question. Um, you can see there, Anne has posted the email for Villages. Um, yeah, check with an audiologist. They, they probably know, uh, you know, they probably work with that now that it's a thing. In fact, a lot of times, uh, you know, hearing aids are adjustable with the phone, right? Like you can, they have an a specialty app that lets you like actually tune your uh, hearing aids on the phone itself. So they must have some experience with stuff like that. Um, I would definitely talk to them. Um, and, and, and maybe your do, maybe your hearing aids need an update. Maybe there's like some kind of upgrade they can do or something like that. How to organize, yes, okay, cool, awesome. We will definitely do that. Um, and I posted the email uh, for Villages uh, so that if you need to get in touch with me, you can get in touch uh, with her through there and she will, um, and she will forward that on. Um, and also uh, next topic is cutting the cord. This is always a really popular one um, where uh, I can, show you some ideas for how to get rid of cable TV, how to um, sort of uh, trim down your bills, how to maybe get rid of landlines or whether or not you want to keep your landline, how to save money on your phone and TV and internet bills and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we will go through that. That's always a really fun, popular lecture. So um, cool. Thank you, Elia. Um, hope you got your answers on VPN. Um, okay, is there any other, are there any other questions or comments? All right, thank you all so much again. Uh, our next class is uh, 519, Cutting the Cord. And then you'll need to 
go back into Punch Pass and sign up for classes in June, July, and August. So hope to see you next in two weeks. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you much. Bye-bye.